discrimination, stigma, and social exclusion. And I've shown here a figure from the Public Health Agency of Canada that looks at the distribution of HIV cases by sex and by race and ethnicity from 2017. And you can see something pretty stark right away. And the first is that among males, 41.7% of, of males with HIV are white. And if you compare that with the bar chart for females, you can see such a different picture. Um, here you see that 86% of females with HIV are black, indigenous, or other women of color. Only 14.1% are, are white. And of that uh, group of black, indigenous, and other women of color, you see that 30.9% are indigenous uh, women living with HIV. And so in all of our work, a health equity approach really um, mandates for us, really a call to action to better understand the needs and priorities of the diverse community of women living with HIV that are in Canada. Next slide, please, Val. And the experience of living with HIV, again, differs a great deal by gender. So compared with men living with HIV, women experience poor HIV and health-related outcomes. And I've shown here some data from BC, from the British Columbia, uh, the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS. And what this figure shows you is that women living with HIV are much less likely to be retained at each step of the HIV care cascade. What this means is that women are less likely to be linked to HIV care. Once they are linked, they're less likely to be retained in that care. When they're in that care, they're less likely to be on life-saving antiretroviral therapy, and then they're less likely to achieve viral suppression, which is the critical indicator for individual health outcomes as well as population health HIV prevention goals. And these inequities extend through to survival. Women living with HIV have a life expectancy that is five to 10 years shorter than that of same aged women without HIV. And they're seven years shorter than that of men who are living with HIV. And so despite these very stark differences and inequities, women living with HIV have not historically been sufficiently included in health research that addresses their needs and priorities. And then by extension, many of their health and healthcare priorities remain unmet. Next slide, Val. So in response, we launched the CHIWO study in 2010. And CHIWO stands for the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study. It is the largest community-based cohort study of women living with HIV, trans and cis inclusive in Canada. And through this study, we enrolled 1,422 women with HIV from three Canadian provinces here in BC, Ontario, and Quebec, and followed them up every 18 months. The study is grounded in critical feminism, in anti-oppression, social justice, and social determinants of health frameworks. And we are committed to the principles of GIPA and NIWA. And GIPA stands for, is a principle that speaks to the importance of greater involvement of people living with HIV AIDS, as well as meaningful in engagement of women living with HIV. And this is critical for us because CHIWOS involves women living with HIV as core partners throughout all our stages of research, including hiring and training women as peer research associates. And our overall aim was to develop a women-centered HIV care model that was geared at addressing the unique health and social needs of women living with HIV. And here in BC, we enrolled 356 women living with HIV, of whom 45% identified as Indigenous. Next slide, Val. Well, thank you. And since launching CHIWOS, our team has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications focused on the health of women living with HIV. And a very key and consistent finding across our research points to inequities among women living with HIV, not only between women and men. And our findings showed that Indigenous women were surviving against systemic forms of discrimination and were particularly underserved. Um, with respect to HIV care. For instance, in this analysis that I'm showing you here, we looked at the HIV care cascade among women enrolled in CHIWOS, and we found that Indigenous women were the most likely to be lost at every stage of the care cascade. 
Now you, I'm sure, well know that there's several epidemiological studies before us, since us, that have shown this stark inequity. But I think what's been really missing from these assessments is a critical examination of why this is the case. Right? Rather than identifying Indigenous women as somehow deficit-based, we haven't really interrogated why this occurs. We're stripping our understandings um, from considering intergenerational impacts of colonization of the residential school system, the 60s scoop, and other government policies predicated and fueled by structural racism that have shaped the experience of what it means to be an Indigenous woman accessing healthcare today. Next slide, real oh, quick. And so we had seen too many studies that had taken this deficit-based approach, and we knew we needed to do something different. And it's with this background that we initiated the Chiwos PA study to understand how Indigenous women living with HIV understand and experience their health through traditional ways of knowing. And I'll just point out here that the terminology of PA stands for Positive Aboriginal Women, woman, um, which is a term that was gifted to us by Keisha Larkin, one of the first Indigenous women to be diagnosed with HIV in BC. And Val, now I'll turn it over for, to you to take us through um, our process of developing and implementing Chiwo's PA. Thank you, Angela. <clears throat> On this journey, we will be sharing ceremony, indigenizing our research, how it is strength and art-based, and how health is connected with nature. Water connects us all. Water is a living thing, a spiritual entity with life-giving forces. The first relationship that we have with water is that with our life giver. We come from water. We were months in water, approximately eight to 10 months. Women are especially strong in spirit during their moon time as the moon cycles the waters. Water is one of the first medicines given to us by the creator. Water is the lifeblood of mother earth and just like the blood that runs through our veins, water runs through Mother Earth. Water is living, water is sacred, water is medicine. A teaching from my grandfather was of the relationship between water and all living things. Creator made the water so all could have life. Creator also knew that some would not be able to find water, so Creator gave water movement. Water would find its own journey, take on different forms, have memory and spirit. Thank you, Grandfather. And from the Assembly of First Nations Honoring Water, they said, our sacred water teaches us that we can have great strength to transform even the tallest mountain while being soft, pliable, and flexible. Many nations across Turtle Island believe the earth to be their mother and the waters to be like the blood that runs in our veins. The oceans, streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, and seas provide life to everything on Mother Earth. New knowledge is old knowledge to new people. I thank my grandfather for that lesson. We are going to today share our process. And this process is a journey, and this is our journey. Teachings that I received from Elder Sean is that we do not have ideas or concepts. They've already been put down by our ancestors for us to pick up. The idea I picked up was a journey into healthcare and the relationship, if there was one, between traditional and Western medicines and how this is navigated. Many words and symbols came to me and were held on whiteboards. I had an idea to use the medicine wheel and doing much searching and researching and asking, and I found that there were many different yet similar teachings. Some nations use different colors. The colors are in different orders. Some nations do not use the medicine wheel. Going back to what my grandfather had taught me, medicine wheels were rocks put on Mother Earth with many different messages, teaching balance of life, the seasons, directions, about grandfather's sun, grandmother moon, father sky, and even the stars. My grandfather also taught me to be fluid. So I went back to the old ways and being from water, living around water of the Salish seas, the water medicine wheel was shown to me. Our first form of communication was drawing on cave walls in the sand or in the dirt. When we didn't know someone else's dialect or language, we used pictures. Basing 
the work on, on the seven sacred teachings of humility, courage, respect, love, wisdom, truth, and honesty, and, vi and using visual ways of doing, this kept our work in a good way. We came to our overarching question, how do Indigenous women living with HIV in the Coast Salish territories understand their health and well-being through traditional ways of knowing? From the question, we, we created our collective canvases, and each woman was given a blank canvas of her own to do her own individual work and to take home with her. I would like to thank Nilu for taking the visions from my head and painting the collective canvas backgrounds. Rooted in ceremony, our first gathering was held virtually and in person, so all members of the tribe could meet each other and get to know each other before arriving at Springbrook Retreat Center. The second gathering was four days at Springbrook, where each day we started with ceremony, where an eagle watched over us, we feasted together, we shared medicines, nature, sharing knowledge, using circles, and end of our day closings. We tried to hold our third gathering virtually because of COVID, and our ancestors spoke. For many reasons, our tribe couldn't get together. Some slept in, others' technology wouldn't work, and some forgot. Our tribe said that this work must be done on the land and in person. We are honoring that. And now we have held our heart-to-heart -heart chats, which is a conversation which e with each of the participants going over all our information. Um, Angela, can I have you read this for me, please? This is the words from one of the women and my screen is a little bit blocked. Oh, my, oh yes, of course, my pleasure, Val. So she says, I was fulfilled with knowledge and the feel of connection with the other ladies. Learning what we were teaching and how easy it was to connect with what we were saying and talking about. Connecting with the ladies and still having connections with the majority of them today is still pretty amazing. Thank you, Angela. From my family teachings, I learned that baskets were in very part and part of our way of life. We used them to collect and carry water, our medicines and foods. At our first opening at Springbrook, Elder Sheila blanketed the women and I was going to give the women a handmade basket made by Joan Ryan, a shim shin weaver made of seagrass and cedar. With these baskets, we recognized our teachings differed and we respected that. And with the very diverse teachings of each tribe member, that they could carry these baskets for either gathering or offerings to the land. As I was walking down a hallway, one of my ancestors spoke to me. I was told that this ceremony of gifting the baskets that were to be used for collecting and offerings and holding of medicines was not mine to do. That Angela, our PI and true ally, that this was to be her journey. I was to be the witness to this ceremony. This was truly connecting our tribe. What happened next is hard to put into words and it's very emotional. It's very spiritual and heartfelt to witness her reaction and the faces of the women upon receiving this gift was truly allyship guided by her ancestors and mine. Our responsibility is to build the road so other, others can travel them. We must indigenize our research from beginning to conclusion. We're using and indigenizing, the, we're using the word indigenizing rather than decolonizing research as we were here before colonists. And the word indigenizing is a strength based with the foundation of positivity. Our first collective canvas spoke to us of earth medicines. I'll let you take it just a moment to enjoy what the women collectively put on this canvas. We had a medicine table that held all our medicines, herbs, teas. There was bear grease, devil's club, bear root, tobacco, lavender, many, many more. We also included cloth and leather for making ties. We shared these medicines. They were left out. They were available throughout. 
And one example was of a tribe member had a headache and instead of going to the first aid kit for Tylenol, she went to this table and used the earth medicines. And the question we asked our tribe was, how do you indigenize medicines and ceremony in your health and healing? And I am going to take this time to ask you, the audience, to think of this question. And if you would like to answer this, please put it in the chat box um, to see how you may answer this question. So I'll give you a few minutes. And again, the question is, how do you use Indigenous medicines and ceremony in your health and healing? And as the messages come in, I will be asking Becky to be reading those out so that she can share them. And Becky, you are on mute. Thank you. Great. So we have some answers coming in. We have someone who's not sure because they don't know of any Indigenous medicines. Others use essential oils, smudging, sage, smudging again with a number of different medicines depending on what someone has. Dancing. Spending time in nature, taking walks in the forest, and deeply breathing in the ocean air. Thank you. Um, sorry, all beautiful, wonderful answers. So what we, we had called the canvas earth medicines, um, and looking at the woman's words, and while looking at the collective canvases, which we had called Earth Medicines. It is now titled, It's a Journey, Earth Medicine Wheel. So why water? Water is lifeblood. Without water, nothing would live, and we are living around the Salish Sea. Water is fluid, ever-changing, takes on many forms, from rain, dewdrops, ice, or fog, and many more. Water is adaptable, and it can change a stone into sand, Water can hear you and has memory. And water will balance itself no matter what angle it's on, it will balance. And a great teaching to learn from is a quote from Ellen White. Water will agree to help you with anything you ask of it. When you take the water off the body, you cannot call in the spiritual energies. Without water in our bodies, we are dead. Not only because of the dehydration that happens in the physical domain, but because of the lack of the spirit energy that signifies life. And the question we asked for this water canvas was how would you love to vision your healthcare? We invite you to take a moment to think about this question. And again, we invite you to put your answers in the chat box. And while these answers are coming in, I hope you're enjoying all these pictures that have been taken. This is where we held all our retreat and did our research was on these beautiful lands. Thank you so much, Val. We have some really wonderful answers coming in. So people are visioning their healthcare with more natural treatments available through benefits. Being treated with kindness and compassion whole person care, including mental health and physical health and emotional health, or enjoying the full benefits of functioning body, spirit, mind, and soul. And some people don't really know how to answer the question saying it's a bit foreign to them to think about, but they would like to spend time in natural environments. And someone else would love to vision their health with a balance of life and in tune with their belief. Really beautiful and with an acknowledgement that their opinion counts. Thank you, so beautiful, so heartfelt. 
So after reading the transcripts and again with the visual collective canvases, the voices summed it up. My body knows a thing or two about a thing or two about my health. So what we had entitled the water wheel visioning is now the title, my body knows a thing or two. Our next canvas explore, explored the bumps and falls in healthcare. And the question we asked was, what bumps and falls did you experience in your healthcare? Again, join us in thinking about your experiences that you may have had. And if you're comfortable, please add them to the chat box. So what bumps and falls did you experience in your healthcare? All right, so we have some other responses coming in. Sometimes their GP disagrees with their approach to healing. More disagreement, having a bad back, prostate cancer, asthma and hay fever as a child. Some are feeling like they were the only ones advocating for themselves. Not being heard and not being taken seriously or every conversation about health issues starting with, you need to lose weight, like they're not even listening to, or assuming that they don't know their own body. Or being told that they're wrong, of not being listened to. Great, thank you everyone so much for sharing. Thank you. And from what we had entitled Bumps and Falls, we heard loud and clear, culture denied. This is our reflection pool. We asked, what supported you to get through these bumps and falls? Which is so important because that is so important because we're standing here strong today. So I think you know what I'm going to ask you to do next. I invite you to answer this question. And as you can see, we wrote the women's answers on these canoes and placed them on this canvas with a mirror that became our reflection pool. All right, and we have some strengths and supports coming in of family and own personal strength, meditation, Tai Chi, hiking, backpacking, snowshoeing and skiing, one's own stubbornness, or having other families going through the same challenges, and having supportive friends that have experienced similar things, grit and determination. Thank you. Supports. Uh, sorry, we have one more come in. I just want to say uh, grit, determination, prayer, and ceremony. Mm, thank you. Thank you and, from, and from Reflection Pool, it is now it has become our canoes of reflection. Bear paw courage. Courage is represented by the bear. The mother bear has the courage and strength to face her fears and challenges while protecting her young. The bear also shows us how to live a balanced life with rest, survival, and play. To face life with courage is to know bravery. Find your inner strength to face the difficulties of life and the courage to be yourself. Defend what you believe in and what is right for your community, your family, and self make positive choices, and have conviction in your decisions. Face your fears to allow yourself to live your life. 
the bear stands tall to remind us of the teaching of courage. Listen to your heart. It takes courage to do what is right. After these teachings, we ask the question, think of a symbol that represents your inner strength. We invite you to think of a symbol and if you can describe it for Becky in the chat box, I would be so glad if you would share that with us. All right, we already have some beautiful imagery coming in. We have a braid and a bungee cord. Hmm. a double-edged sword, a big cedar tree, mm. a sun, a plant with deep roots and flowers, a phoenix, an eagle, ocean waves and seeds sprouting, a woman, wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you so much. And from Bear, Stoss, Bear Paw Strengths, we are now entitled the canvas, Children of the Bear Tribe. Rivers of change. It takes courage to make change. I like the teachings of the sweet grass told to me by my grandfather. We cannot do this alone. When you pull on a single strand of sweet grass, it will break. When you braid it, it becomes strong. Each bundle of strands in the braid represents mind, body, and heart, and tied together with spirit. You must use all three in your daily living or your life will not have balance. And the question we asked for the Rivers of Change was, think of a message that you would like to share with your healthcare providers. What would you say? Wow, some really strong messages. Please listen to me. Believe me. You think you're listening to me, but you aren't, not really. There's more to me than just what you can measure. I know my body best. Be patient. These are some really strong messages to healthcare providers. I'm here for your help. Let's do this together. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And the names, or the name, the Rivers of Change, is now called Water Women Rising. That is, to me, just such a strong visual of women just coming out of the water and giving this message to healthcare providers. Being looked after. While in our sharing circle, where the women were telling of their histories of bumps and falls in their healthcare, and this, as you can imagine, was very powerful, yet we could feel the hurt and the anger. When all of a sudden, four leggeds came by the window and we all went to look and take pictures and watch them as they watched us. Nature had taken care of us, the energy shifted, and the session went on with spirit lifted hearts. We did many self care activities throughout our gatherings. And also to let you know that Elder Sheila was with us, always with us. She was always reading the room. She was caring for us and holding us in ceremony. As we did ceremony throughout the gathering, 
We continue to have ceremony back at the offices. Before reading the tribe's words or looking at the collective canvases, we always started with ceremony. We brought with us medicines of sage, sweetgrass, cedar, tobacco, lavender, an eagle feather, our ceremonial blanket, which you may have seen in a previous slide of two fish giving each other a message. And we also listened to a song by Alex Turtle and Shinoa Igawa, the song to the elements or their water song. We also listened to the Algonquin water song written by Wahaheti Jerome. One day we were running behind. We were a bit late. We rushed ceremony. We only brought the feather and the sage into the room. No work could be done. Nothing would come to us. We even struggled with reading the women's words and we continued to struggle. And then we stopped. We said, this isn't being done in a good way. We stopped, we grounded ourselves, we took the time, we listened to the song of the elements, we did ceremony, and we felt the whole room change. It was such a powerful, the energy, it actually hugged us. We all got goosebumps and then the words spoke to us. For those working in research, we use those Western words. And after a month of working with the voices and visuals from the women, we had a meeting with Angela and you should have seen her face when we told her we didn't have a code book for our research. And of course, with our indigenous humor, I let her go on and really uh, be flustered and confused. And then we gave her our indigenous words of doing. So here is our vessel that holds this. The code book now became the vessel that honors the voices. Themes became streams. Sub-themes or chapters, we call creeks. Dramatic analysis, we call is honoring voices. And knowledge translation and exchange is now around the fire. We are building that road so others can build with us and walk alongside of us. And here are our um, vessels. Traditional medicines and ways of knowing or healing. Health is connected with nature and is a circle. Protection, gifts, journey, blood memories, consequences of colonialism, teachings, community, two-eyed seeing, and tug of war between indigenous and Western ways. I honor the voices of the women that gave us this knowledge. I'm gonna lose my spot. When I do PowerPoint presentations, I have all the words and the knowledge. I then add a picture or a diagram. On this journey, it was the pictures. The pictures came to us first. The voices of the tribe spoke, are in our ancestors' voices, it easily flowed and guided this work to indigenize our research. This picture taken by Angela, Becky, and myself was at the end of our second gathering. We set up all the canvases in the room. And when the women came in in the morning, this is what they saw. And then we had our tribe's closing circle. As you can imagine, it was very connective and very emotional. We invite you to share with us one word or two that describes taking this journey with us today. Wow, we have lots of words, a blessing compassion, powerful, comforting, beautiful, amazed, peace. Kindness, reflective, hopeful, appreciative. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your words and of the journey. Oh, and we have another one, empathy. 
Thank you. Um, that made my eyes leak. Uh, this is where you can contact us. Um, I've left that up for a few minutes. Um, I would like to raise our hands up to our funders, CIHR, the AHA Center, and Simon Fraser University. I would like to say Wellen, which is thank you in my language. Um, thank you in many languages from across Turtle Island and all my relations. Wow, Valerie, just an incredible um, presentation from all, from all of you and um, just really powerful, really appreciated all the, inter the opportunities to interact. Um, we do have a, just a few minutes. Um, if, you, if there's questions that anybody has from the group, is, is the panel still good to, uh, to answer a few questions for a few more minutes? Wonderful. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and put in, it into the chat box. Um, yes, Nancy, um, go ahead and if you can, if you can unmute, mute, unmute, mute yourself. And if not, just type it into the chat box and I will read it out. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Oh, Go perfect. ahead, Nancy. Um, just uh, thank you so much for that presentation. It was so very different than many presentations that I'm used to hearing in, in the CITR funding world. So it was really heartfelt. And my gratitude um, actually is, is, is uh, difficult to express in words. Um, I have a practical question because those are often the questions that I have is, how are you going to take this and inform um, change in how healthcare is delivered? Angela or Becky, yeah. um, <laughs> I have spoken enough. I think you're probably pretty okay, I'll give you, okay, fair, fair enough, Val. I'll, I'll start. Um, Nancy, thank you so much for that question because it is actually one of the core objectives of this project is to make sure that we are getting this information back to healthcare providers. And one, um, one we, we've actually started with uh, developing relationships with providers and other stakeholders in Fraser Regional Health Authority. Um, and, and in that work, what, what we are, what we are, Sorry, what we've been doing is we've met with a couple of key stakeholders in Fraser and shared a similar presentation as we've shared today. And they're actually part of the group that really encouraged us to reach out to the SPOR and, and kind of continue to share this work a bit more broadly. And what they've encouraged us to do is to take this, uh, you know, slightly adapted versions of this work and present to different, um, to different groups. So one is the a group of clinicians that provides HIV care for uh, people living with HIV in the Fraser region. Another group is a, the, Becky's gonna correct my description of this, of, this, um, of this group, but an indigenous health um, action group in Fraser. That's not their specific name, but that's their mandate. Um, and to share with them our process, some of our learnings. One thing that Val has not yet shared with you is that we do have several uh, pieces, we have results from this research. She's mostly shared with you our process. And part of that um, is that we have conducted an analysis of what the women shared with us. And now we're going back to those women to say, you know, this is what we're learning from what you shared. Is this, you know, does this reflect what you wanted to share with us? Right, so doing that validation process with the participants themselves and then going out to these different specific groups um, who have responsibility and I think accountability to Indigenous women in the healthcare space and presenting these findings and opening up those conversations. We, we our plan as you know, COVID has disrupted many things, including one of our goals of this research was to host a large community forum where we would invite healthcare providers, social care providers, frontline workers, other stakeholders, um, present this work and open it up for an active discussion around, all right, what can we do in our own spaces to integrate some of these learnings? So I'll, I'll pause there and open it to Elder Sheila, Val, or Becky to add anything else. The only other thing I'd like to um, say is that the women, if they choose to be, will be involved in bringing it back to community. 
Um, they have given us consent to share their personal canvases, but they can be active in the, when we go out and hold, um, when we can get together and hold these presentations. And I can see Nancy and I think Tina had asked earlier about um, medical students, students in medical yes. schools. And I think that's a great health, health professional education program. Fantastic question. So um, while Val just takes a moment to catch her breath, I'll just share with you that she does teach um, classes with Dr. Mary Kessler to medical students at UBC. She also, um, we also teach uh, students in the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU where I hold my position. Um, and, and we also bring this, this research and this process uh, to those students. And if you're interested in, in inviting Val, I'm sure is the person, please, you know, don't, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us um, after this presentation. It would be wonderful to connect. How can I contact you? Um, Tina, I think we put our email addresses in the chat and oh, fantastic. Our emails are there. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Even if you reach out to one of us, we, you will find all of us. So um. <laughs> no problem. I would do that. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Um, and um, if there's any other, is there any other questions? We have a few more minutes. Um, although I will admit to this group that there's somebody at my door. So I apologize. I'm going to turn my camera off, still listen. Uh, so if there's any other questions, please, please uh, ask. We got about another couple of minutes and then we'll close this session off and go to the main group. Or not. Maybe what I'll do is just give us a few extra minutes of rest before our next um, session begins at 3.30. So my um, sorry, oh, it, sorry Deanne, just before you close, um, mm -hmm. kind of practically, I'd like to ask Elder Sheila to, to, to properly close our session um, together. And, and so she, Elder Sheila, can I pass it over to you? Absolutely. Well, I was gonna invite each of us to Gather our breath, thank the maker of breath, breathe in deeply through your nose, right into your diaphragm, out with your mouth. Imagine yourself as you breathe in, integrating this knowledge, all of this information, this storytelling, integrate it into your being. Breathe out anything you don't need through your mouth. Please touch your mind on your feet, how they are connected to the earth. We release those ancestors that have been holding us. We release any of the energies that we no longer need to carry into our next sessions. Grandmothers and grandfathers and spirits of the four directions, go with us now. Lim Lim, thank you for carrying us to this point. All my relations. Thank you so much, Elder Sheila. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. My apologies. Um, and again, let me express my deep gratitude. This was an incredibly powerful session. And I really appreciate everybody's um, efforts to, to bring your your message to us. We, we really appreciate it. So with that and with proper closing from Elder Sheila, I invite us all to just take a couple of minutes and join us for the 3.30 session. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.